Kangusa. Ah, 
Ai! Tá. Não! Tchê, Anneke! Ah oh! So oh! Chu! Hey! Chu! 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 Ta 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 Yin! Bye! Posta? Look! Cutter! 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 Ana! Barba! Barba!
Liberal. Tyranny tool, 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 tool. Et c'était... Pour Ter, 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 Minali, minali, minali. Flip. Estro. Yemi, bread, bread. What a who? Lice. Abrani. Tima pro pro pro. Pro. Aji samal. Samal samal samal. Ebenichku. Chista chista. Od gro 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 gro. Tla tla tla. Notimo! Krik, bru, 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 bru! Chi, doi, doi! Sti! Zrjan! Ich, ele, ele! K, tričnih, tričnih, tričnih! Kla! Zomnih, oč, oč! Iu, iu, iu! Borba! Borba!
Good morning, everyone. My name is Dorte Kolling, and I am chairwoman of the Danish organization Bien Denmark. It's a great pleasure for me to stand here for the first time alongside representatives from all the Nordic countries and joined by a variety of well-known and hard-working UBI advocates from Europe and even from the US. Thanks all of you for making this trip to Denmark. I owe my thanks to the event team led by Carsten Lieberkind. Thank you for making this conference possible and also thank you to the speakers for joining us and enlightening us with your expert knowledge. I would also like to thank the Alternative Party for hosting this event here in this marvelous government, government building, the Danish Parliament. Thanks are also due to our sponsors for backing us financially. Last but not least, thanks to all of you who have come here to participate and support such an important course. I can see that you're all awake and alert, so I gather that you had a good night's sleep after a wonderful evening in good company. Let me begin the session by showing you two different circles. We already have one here on the screen. It illustrates, this circle illustrates, illustrates what we are in at present, and the next one illustrates what we intend to shape with the idea of UBI. So this circle is built upon scarcity. We think we don't have enough money, stuff, everything. We, that's what we are told, so we have to save it all. We have to save, 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 also these years in our welfare states and in the Western world, actually. That leads to more control, control of the citizens, and control always leads to fear and the feeling of being unfree, and with fear follows resistance. My first word was actually violence, and I, I um, changed it to, um, to resistance because resistance is uh, more like uh, the society today. We uh, withdraw ourselves, and uh, we talk about all the things we, are not, uh, we don't like in our society, but we don't do a lot. So resistance also can be passive, and that's a dangerous situation too. And after that, we become inhumane. So that's rather a pessimistic circle to talk about. So uh, I'd better put another one on. And that's all about uh, the, um, the, the way we uh, should be thinking if we would su succeed in life. And that's what I think that we can uh, do if we um, change our conviction and our mindsets from scarcity to a mind of abundance. If we feel that, that we have enough, we also get the feeling of safetyness, and that follows, followed by freedom and joy. And when we are feeling safe and joy and free, we uh, are willing to share. And when we share, we get in more stuff and more uh, love and more everything, even more money. So it seems very simple, doesn't it? It's just a shame that we have been brainwashed into supporting the first setup. It can be pretty hard work to change our neural network the hard wiring installed in our brains to shift from one conviction to the opposite way of thinking. Well, I know that we all agree on the blessings of UBI, more or less, but we have quite a big job to do in helping our fellow citizens changing their mindsets. I know it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Anyway, 
We hope that you have been inspired by yesterday's many contributors. The theme was experimentations and pilots of UBI lookalike models. Today, I hope that we can move further towards designing long-term, genuine experiments so that real, actual IB UBI thinking can be implemented during my children's lifetimes. This is urgent as we are currently engaged in a race against techno technological developments and are exceedingly challenged by the inequality and poverty in the world's underdeveloped countries and also by stress and by control and coercion in our own welfare states. I would like you to consider whether pilots may, in fact, be a waste of valuable time. A pilot should at least be more like a UBI complying with European standards, unconditional, universal for all individuals, and large enough to support a decent standard of living. And that's what we heard yesterday, amongst others, uh, guys standing, talking about. A pilot will always be temporary. It will begin and it will end. And what will that mean in itself? The benefit of UBI for the individual is that she is free to design her own way of life and her own living standard during her entire life. I hope I have understood the Finnish pilot in the right way when I see or think that it might continue if it generates positive results. But how is it possible to measure success after just a single year? And who is the judge? Who is going to assess the results? Opponents or supporters? The leaders or the people? And will the data be reliable? Given that, we are certain that robots will take over many of today's work tasks and leave more people unemployed, why don't we use that fact as a gift and not as a threat? Why have we not already designed the new economic model for that wonderful future for humanity, which it could be if we share the profits? That said, I agree that we have to di have discussions about the pilots, and that's why we are here. It makes good sense that we in the Nordic countries cooperate about these issues. We can inspire and learn from each other, but we can also choose to coordinate our efforts and place different experiments in different countries and then compare them afterwards. And we can do this precisely because our societies have so much in common with regard to culture, heritage, and our welfare models. I don't exclude Europe, but this today we are, have our focus on the Nordic countries. So uh, excuse me, Europe, we haven't forgotten you. But the question is always also whether the Nordic peoples, our populations, are well enough informed. How long will it take us to spread the word until everybody knows what UBI means so they can take their stand on it? Do we believe that the shift of paradigm should come from the top or come from the bottom or grow from both directions? The new paradigm can easily be, be, ter be turned over or brushed aside with laughter and cool calculations, but these days we meet an increasingly large number of people who share our values and our ideas. Now we just have to make them ready to fight for them. I believe that here, at this point in time, we are close to the middle of the third wave, as Carl Weiderquist has called this period in UBI period, history. That means that we have been talking for a long time, and now the time has come to act. And we must act. 
which very neatly leads me right into today's program. Today we shall hear from several Nordic partic participants participants about what is going on in the different countries. We'll round off the day with nearly two hours of panel debate where the discussion will focus on the perspectives of closer cooperation between and among Nordic countries so that we can strengthen our mission and make UBI come true as a worthy and dignified development of our welfare systems. Borrowing the words of Philip Van Paris, let's get ready to move from a worn out net to a firm floor. My hope is that we can move forward, continuing to strengthen our network so that we can make progress in our mission, not just more quickly, but also more powerfully. And with that, I welcome you all to a new day and to an exciting debate. Thank you very much. It hurts me that, I, that I'm not here to hear all the, the speakers. Uh, luckily, we get it on film. So uh, some of the ones I, was, I haven't seen, people have always been saying to me, oh, Torsten, this one you have to see on television. And I'm going to do that. One of the reasons why, I, uh, why I'm not here all the time is that behind the scenes here in Christiansborg, there's a very, very chaotic work going on preparing an unexpected election. Uh, preparing, it has not been made yet, but we, we have a situation where there's about 10% possibility, I think, about 10% possibility that the election is, is, is uh, called out in a few weeks. About 10%. And a lot of people say that it'll only it'll, it'll be about around New Year, or before New Year, after New Year. But when you have, when we estimate that there's 10 percent chance for an election in the coming weeks, we have to be ready, completely ready, all of us. And everybody say, every party say, we're ready. We're completely ready. We look forward to it. But I will assure you that no one is ready. <laughs> Because it's only uh, about a year ago, it's only about 14, 15 months ago, we had the last election. And this election has something to do with what I told some of you yesterday, that the government takes a lot of money from, uh, from, from, from the welfare benefits, and part of that money they want to spend in, in, in top tax reductions in reducing tax for the richest. That's the way it's, it's clearly said by the government when they, when they came into power, we want to make, want to take money from the welfare, from the social benefits, and we want to put them into uh, tax reduction in the top. And there's a big con a party con uh, supporting the government that don't want that. They have agreed to take money from the poor, from the uh, welfare benefits, but they will not give it to the people, to the, to the rich, in tax reductions. So we have two parties sitting in, 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 in two different trees, high up in the trees. One saying, we want those tax reductions for the wealthiest. The other one say you won't, you won't get them. And in the middle we have our prime minister trying to navigate. And uh, and that means that the political situation is, is, is very, very unstable. And that also means that behind these scenes, there's a lot of work going on. Printing posters. The, the parties are asking, do we have any posters? Do we have any plan? <laughs> what is our election campaign program? What, what? And that is being prepared for every party at the moment in a very, very, very high uh, speed. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. And it also inflicts my, my, my participation here, but luckily I'm going to see it on TV. 
Uh, I can see that some new persons here today. And you did not see yesterday how I uh, told you our, the alternatives plans for welfare benefits, social benefits, content your boon uh, how we want to make that. And also stressing that it's not a basic income pilot. We're not there yet. But it's a huge step down that alley, seen from our point of view, where we're going to face some of the challenges that anybody who's interested in basic income are going to face and are going to find very, very clever solutions about. Mm -hmm. Today I'm, talk I'm going to talk very little about, uh, about basic income and, and about our model, the, the, the welfare uh, benefits and social benefits without requirements. And more about the perspectives that we see, the economic de uh, development that we see these plans fitting into. And I've allowed myself to be a bit wild and, 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 and to be a bit visionary. I mean, I'm among people with a big vision because nobody has ever seen a full-scale basic income function anywhere. But it's still so present in our minds. Uh, so so I, I feel free to, to, to be a bit visionary now. Uh, Uh, all this, uh, what, what, what I'm talking about today is what do we expect of the future? And uh, how, what do we want the future to be? Uh, and when we, in the alternative, look in our crystal ball, was crystal cool, we experience again and again that our crystal ball says something very different from the crystal ball in the government and in many of the other Danish parties. Not only the government, but maybe 80% of the Danish parties in the Danish parliament has a crystal ball that shows something different from the one we have in the alternative. Of course, there are areas where we see the same, but I have a feeling that some of those areas we analyze different what we see. When the government look in their crystal ball, they have made a 2025 plan, a plan for year 2025. And they see the need to get hundreds of thousand people into the labor market. They see that jobs will pop out in thousands. Jobs will pop off in hundreds of thousands. Therefore, they've made a 2025 plan a plan for the year 2025, that among other things, prolong the age of the pensions so that people have to leave the labor market later than they want, no matter how worn out they are. It also means that we will get a lot of people who are actually worn out physically, but they will still live for, for, for 20, 30 years. Uh, they also lower the social benefits, as I talked about yesterday, to make people, because they say when we lower the social benefits, people will look for, for work. We call that to hunt jobs that are hardly there. And maybe many of them are, are ill, so they're not able to take the job, even if it was there. Uh, and that is to finance tax redu reductions in the top. Also, there's very hard pressure on the Danish education system, where the Big reforms try to push people very fast through the educations by uh, uh, forcing people to take exams very faster, very much faster, and reducing the economic support. I'm, I'm, I'm myself, uh, uh, I have my own company, I only have four employees. And I think that's a, very difficult, 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 that's a very bad thing to do, because when I hire people, and we have two people with the same education, I ask, who have had a year on traveling? Who have had, of you two, have, had, have made some voluntary work, political work, humanitarian work? Who of you have done something that shows me that you can work together with people? I mean, all those skills that you earn 
for having a bit time in the education system to do something else and educate yourself. It gives you skills that, 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 that the companies need. But that's taken away now. Uh, because we want people to get fast through the education system. I think that the government in Europe also, also even the Social Democrats and the Labour parties in many countries, they keep trying to prepare the European societies for a situation of great economic growth and full employment that hardly ever exists. Or maybe it exists every 20, 30 or 50 years. Last time we saw it was in 2006, 2008. But it is like the government keeps preparing for that ideal version of the market economy where we have high growth and work for everybody. And in my point of view, and now you must excuse me for being very political, I am a politician after all. In my point of view, I feel that the government of Europe reduces the citizens to a kind of foot soldiers, spending our lives fighting for the competition society, fighting for the neoliberal economic growth fantasy. But what do we see then when we look at the crystal ball standing in the alternative residence, which is being called the Green Corridor here at uh, Christiansborg? We see a future in maybe just 10 or 15 years, where somebody is preparing for his or her dinner by printing a nice steak. Printing a nice steak in the 3D printer. And the steak will not be made of meat, but it will taste like a steak. It has the same flavor as a steak. So one of the things we see in the future is the 3D printer is coming into our universe and changing the world quite much. It is already, actually. What does that mean if we have that kind of uh, digital and, and robot solution? It means that it, 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 it will have an effect on the labor market. Uh, it means that all the people who, near, who, who used to produce this steak, or many of the people who, who, who produce this steak, will be out of work. I know that new jobs will come because somebody has to produce the printers and repair the printers. But this is one of the examples how robotization, technology, and digitalization are going to take away a lot of jobs. One of my colleagues, just to be, just to keep <laughs> being up here, Josephine Fock, our uh, spokesman of finance in the alternative, she imagined another example the other day. She said, when you go to the doctor in 20 years, I think that you'll put your finger into a hole in an automat. And when you take it out, the display will tell you if you're ill. And if you have a disease, you'll go to the next machine and you'll get your medicine. Imagine again how many jobs will disappear if that vision is right. And I'm telling you this example just to say, it's not only jobs in the production area that will disappear from the digitalization and robotization. It's all kinds of jobs. It's also jobs with high education. I cannot guarantee you that any of these two examples are going to work exactly like that in the future. But I think so. More or less, it is so development happens so fast that in 20 years, we would laugh if we look back at us sitting here with our unintelligent, unintelligent clothes and heavy iPhones and having to drive the cars ourselves. Some of you probably think that I have now left the ground and is flying around in, the, in some in imaginary world, and I would not blame you. But if, if we look at what the experts say, we find many different organizations that believe that robots, digitalization, and new technology will take away, away very many jobs from the Danish and the European societies in the future. 
both right and left wing winged sinking tanks in Denmark, like Kraka and Sevilla. And even experts from LO, the biggest organizations of Danish unions, suggest in different ways and approximately that in 20 years, robots, new digital solutions, and new technology might have taken away 800,000 jobs in Denmark. I'm aware that new jobs will be made because we have to build the robots, develop the digital programs and the new technology. And we have to run it all and we have to repair it all. But I do not think that we can create 800,000 new jobs doing that. I think that hundreds of thousand jobs, uh, people across different branches, with or without high education, will lose their work, will lose their job. And that shows us that there is a great difference in the versions, in the crystal balls of the government and the alternatives. The government in Denmark has made a 2025 plan that tries to push 200,000 people into the labor market. In our crystal ball, we see that hundreds of thousands of jobs are disappearing in 10 years, 20 years. So our 2025 plan has different elements than the one from the most government in Europe. We expect high unemployment in the future, and therefore we have political suggestions that relate to that. We want to change the tax system, so we slowly lower the income tax, because you know robots, they don't pay tax. We want to lower slowly the income tax and put tax on resources, higher, slowly higher the tax on resources, especially the ones that are becoming more and more rare and the ones we are spending, using up on our planet that, where we don't have any more. Uh, and we also want to raise tax on financial tax transactions, fortunes, inherited fortunes. We have to slowly start raising tax on those things if we want some of the values that we have produced to get back into society. And now we slowly get back to the welfare benefits without requirements and the basic income again. Because we also want to reduce the average working time from 27, from, 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 from 27, from 37. <laughs> that was too good to be true. From 37 to 30 hours in a period of 10 years. It will take me at some time to explain you the calculation in that and how that's going to work without lowering the wages. And you can see that in our program. I'll, I'll not be specific around about that here. I don't have so much time. Uh, but we do that because we have to share the work when we get less of it. In Denmark, we have gone from, 48, from a working week average of 42 hours to 30 seven hours from 1966 to 1990. There we went down in working. Yeah, we have had it even much higher before that. But in that period I talk about here, from 1966 to 1990, where we went from 42 to 237 hours, our productivity raised 170%. So no disaster came at all. Uh, in, this, in the alternative, we're sure we can go much further down that lane and reduce the average working week to down about 30 hours. And then we regard welfare benefits without requirements and basic income as very important elements in the post-neoliberal society. We have a welfare benefits without requirement as a formal part of our political program. And as I told you yesterday, we are very interested in the basic income pilots. Very, very interested. 
basic income, it's not a part of our official program yet. But you can imagine that is very interesting for us, according to the visions we see in our crystal ball. I'll end by saying a few things about what we see in the future about the post-neoliberal society. As we see the world in the alternative today, we are in the beginning of the end of what we call the, 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 the neoliberal economic development. Uh, to explain that, I have to go a bit back in history. And here we see that our Nordic welfare system is a result of investments in people, in life quality, in education, in trying to make people feel good, in good life. In 1830, 13, I think it was, Denmark went bankrupt. And when you go bankrupt, you can do a lot of chaotic things. We were clever. The year after, we made a very, very big school reform, saying that everybody had to go to school. And from there, we have invested in people. Not only the government, but also the civil society has invested in people. Most of this comes from the civil society. We have the cooperation movement, where people own part of the production machines, the production areas. We have the high school movement, which is very special in Denmark. We have something called high schools. It's not like American high schools. It's high schools where you live for, for instance, a year. Young people live for a year. And they, they go out of the school system, or they do it after the school system, before the education. And that's about culture, sport, journalism. Uh, you don't know, but this means that you've got 30 seconds left. OK. And if she stands up, you have no time left. OK. <laughs> That cultural and that, and that investment in people, we think an alternative have, have brought this innovation wave that has lasted, that has given us growth and welfare for a long, 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 long time. But we think that we are in the end of that wave and we want to kickstart the next wave. The problem was around, said where is Guelia, I have much, not, not much time. Our problem is that we think about the 80s and 90s, we started taking the money that we used to invest in people, in education, in culture, in good life, and put it directly into business. And when you do that, you get a kind of growth that leads to uh, money getting out of society. And now 65% people owns as lot as half of the rest of the world they own. We want to get investment in people back. That is the best thing. If you invest in people, if you invest in education, you will kickstart a new innovation wave. And, uh, and, and, and that's our plan for the future. And of course, welfare benefits without requirements and basic income is a very, very interesting part of that plan. Also to give the labor firm another meaning. Right now, Labor is made up in what you earn. We have to be able to regard labor not only as what your wage is, but what value does it make to society. And that means we probably we suddenly start respecting the voluntary labors, the humanitarian labors, the cultures, the arts, all the things that we expect to be a part of society when we do not longer, any longer want to focus so much on a material spending. So that was my words for today. And uh, I would say that these words reflect one, one, one thing we've said to each other when we start this party. Sometimes we might sound naive. Sometimes we might sound like we are uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a kind of a trip. But we've said to ourselves, we want to have the guts to imagine ourselves a radically different future. Thank you.